podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Do you remember what happened on September 21st, 1989? That was when Hugo brought his hurricane right into Piedmont, North Carolina. And Nick Brown remembers, even though he was just a young boy when it happened, and he set the stories in his first published book, Flood Markers, right there in the time of Hugo. And we'll get him to tell us about Hugo and the stories of Hugo when he's our guest on North Carolina Book Watch next. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV, and by the Mary Duke Biddle Foundation, Quail Ridge Books and Music, and the North Carolina Humanities Council. Welcome to North Carolina Book Watch. I'm D.G. Martin, and my guest is Nick Brown, who's the author of a new book, Flood Markers, set in the time of uh, Hurricane Hugo. And uh, Nick, I was right that you grew up, that you were growing up in Greensboro during Hugo. I was yeah. wrong with the date, and it's uh, September 21st, September 22nd. So if any of you missed, any, if any of you missed the question, it's my fault. You get full credit. <laughs> get full credit. Well, the book starts on the 21st, and you win. The characters in the novel learn about Hugo. Well, it's not, they've already heard about Hugo. It's been on the news, but they're ready for it. And it rolls into town on the 22nd. Well, Nick, you're, uh, this is your first, uh, this is your first book of fiction. Yeah. Uh, you've got a brand new one coming up about tennis called Doubles, which right. we're also said in North Carolina, we're anxious to see. Uh, you've, um, one of the badges that aspiring young writers like to have is that you're a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and bring that and brought that back to Chapel Hill. Mm. You worked for uh, some time at the Aquin yeah. in the uh, public relations part of that, but you're leaving us to go to uh, Colorado. Why are you leaving North Carolina? Well, well, I've been hired as an English professor in Colorado and we don't want to leave North Carolina at all, but it's um, it's too good an opportunity. Well, we're going to declare you to be permanent North Carolinians based on the fact that your <laughs> work, that your uh, your fiction so far is set right here. Yeah. Flood Markers, the book that we're going to talk about today is an unusual book uh, in a number of respects. One is that all of the action is compacted into these two dates, September 21st and 22nd. Yeah. And um, what's what sort of what were you thinking about when you started constructing this book? What was your plan? Well, when I started writing it, I was writing unconnected short stories that all use this same trope of this uh, extreme weather event. And um, they all took place around the same time period and the weather event wasn't Hugo when I first started working on these stories. And I started to think, you know, what, what storm happened, you know, in the late 1980s? And Hugo is the one that came to mind because it was very memorable for me because I got out of school. I was 12 years <laughs> old and I, you know, I really wanted the storm to come j straight through Greensboro and just devastate because I wanted the excitement, you know? And of course, it's a ridiculous hope and, you know, Charlotte really got nailed as did Charleston and it, you know, wasn't a funny thing. It wasn't, you know, exciting in a good way, but as a 12-year-old, I just wanted the, you know, the, the big bang. Well, that's interesting. So, it, uh, Hugo was useful to you, but it wasn't the driving event that, that got you into the telling of these stories. No, I what mean. It was? Well, human conflict, really, you know? I mean, if you read the book, the book's not about Hurricane Hugo. The book is set during Hurricane Hugo, and Hurricane Hugo is the event that happens in this town that allows the daily lives of the characters to get turned on edge just enough that it allows this moment of something singular and amazing to happen. Well, the, the book, then you characterize as a book of short stories. Well, you know, I call it a novel. I call it a book of short stories. It is somewhere in between the two. It's a linked collection of stories that all happened during Hurricane Hugo in the same town, 
and the, and the characters reappear throughout the stories. But I wrote the book so that each story could be read on its own, each chapter could be read by itself, and it would stand as its let own. Me, let me press you on that. If, yeah. uh, looking at it as a novel, is there a, is there a theme or a message that you can describe that links it together other than the hurricane? Well, yes. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that there's a, a yearning for something to happen, which comes back to that youthful yearning that I had as a 12-year-old, you know, in Greensboro. The book is set in the fictional town of Leicester, North Carolina, where not much is going on. And so they want this storm to come, in a sense, because they're excited about something happening. And uh, a lot of stuff does happen on this one day. And for me, the book and a number of the stories end on a hopeful note. There's some very dark uh, situations and some real complicated conflict, but uh, for me, it's sort of a, you know, a hopeful reemergence from this, this small event. It, that it's a, it's a, is, as a novel, it's a novel of hopefulness in the middle, in the midst of uh, challenging situations. Yeah. Would you say that? Yeah. As a group of uh, short stories that are connected thematically, mm -hmm. are there? Who, th there are characters who come in and out of the different stories. Yes. Is there a major character? Or, or major, are, the, are there major characters? Well, the first story introduces us to a young man named Cliff, who is a very innocent young soul thrown into an immediately strange situation. All right, now this is family television, mm -hmm. but you can tell us where he is. Well, the very first chapter opens with a 17-year-old Cliff in town for his cousin's wedding, and he finds himself in a tanning salon in the early morning hours in the midst of a rather wild party and he shows up because he's waiting for the appearance of his cousin who he's deeply in love with <laughs> so he so the, and the cousin is the pers is the is the center of the wedding that's to take the cousin is the center of the wedding and you know cliff for me he shows up a few times throughout the throughout the book. And for me, he's the character I most identify with and that I want the reader to most I identify with because he's the first character whose eyes um, we see, through whose eyes we see Lystra for the first time. And it's a strange place. And for the reader, it's a strange place too. Well, just to be sure we don't misunderstand each other, Cliff yep. is, at the, is at w in one point kind of an innocent yep. as young, young, young man. Yeah. And the other, he's very experienced in the sense that he's been making love to his cousin who's the <laughs> bride and he's he's innocent in the sense that he doesn't know how the groom is going to react to him if should he ever find out about this and what what happens they, what happens then well I, although he's gotten himself in some strange situations i still think of him as a sort of innocent young guy but you know i mean for me i'm always terrified that the reader is going to be bored i'm i have this ah. innate terror that the reader is going to just close my book and stop reading. So from the moment I start writing, I like to try to make the reader uncomfortable. And for me, there's nothing more uncomfortable I could imagine than being in a tanning salon at, at you know, 4 a.m. with a bunch of naked strangers waiting for a cousin that you're in love with. So A cousin that you're in love with who's getting married <laughs> to somebody else exactly. but, and that you've had this secret. Well, I would have to say you succeeded, as far as this reader is concerned, in making me uncomfortable <laughs> in the very first story. And so um, I'm not angry with you about mm. that, but I am accusing you of using a trick to get me to stay with you through the rest of the well, book. It's fiction. It's all smoke and mirrors. You know, we're l we make it up, you know. Um, so, yeah, we all use tricks. I mean, we're uh, underhanded and sneaky. Tell us how Cliff, uh, what Cliff does, how he comes in and out of the other stories yeah. in the book and is he does he remain or does he become a central character in some of the other stories well he becomes a secondary character in some of the other stories um, but for me the reason I identify Cliff as the central character is because of that introduction you know when as a reader when you start a novel the character whose perspective you first encounter you really imprint yourself on and since he is the first person that we encounter coming into Lystra, uh, he's the entrance for us as a reader into this town. And also, the rest of the characters, for the most part, in the book are natives of the town. He is not. And as a reader, um, I think we can all identify with uh, characters in different 
specifics about this town, but we don't live there. One of the other strong characters that I, identif that, that I don't know whether I identified with him or not, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I liked yeah. and was very interested in was uh, the, the guy who worked in the meat packing factory. Oh, yeah. And will you tell us about him and why he's an important part of your book? Well, he there. What was his name? I forgot. Uh, remember? Um, oh no, that's well, okay. No, no, his name's Bryce. Bryce, yeah, Bryce. Um, I remember now. But he, you know, he as well as a few other characters in this novel are facing um, fatherhood in an early stage of their this life. This is a, he's in a young marriage, and like many young marriages, mm. uh, and particularly when there are economic challenges, it's challenging. Yes, exactly. And I didn't yet have a child, but I had friends who had young children when I was writing the book. And so that story, as well as a few of the others, was a way for me to explore that situation of becoming a grown-up. Tell me, let me get you to do this for me, because yeah. this is very powerful in your book, and that is the description of what it's like to work in mm -hmm. a meatpacking factory. And that yeah. is something that's real important to North Carolina, but maybe not as well-known or experienced among our great literary community. <laughs> how'd you, how, what, what did you set out to do and how did you uh, be sure that you knew what was going on in the meatpacking? I had a friend who had worked the graveyard shift in a hot dog factory and he would tell these stories that were just amazing. And so I'd heard these stories over dinner and um, at parties, you know, for years and just finally asked him one afternoon if I could sit down and take notes on what he told me. And um, the conflict of having hopes and dreams that are more than working in a hot dog factory combined with the weird uh, relationship between workers in this strange situation especially when it comes to racial conflicts in this strange sort of social strata that emerges in a lot of workplaces but especially becomes amplified late at night in a meatpacking you know uh, factory. Like what? What goes on there that, um, that that you thought that stunned you enough so that you thought you would stun us in well, your story? Well, specifically in this story, I'm interested in that the graveyard shift is all Hispanic or African American with the exception of the manager and then the protagonist of the story who are white. And uh, the power dynamics between those who control the meat packing and those who control the casing and the cleanup um, it just was a fascinating little world that seemed unbelievably complicated to take place in the, this Tell little Tell us a factory. little bit more of this story yeah. and how it resolves itself. Well, the, the character Bryce is working the gra graveyard shift in a hot dog factory because he does have this young family. And he ends up being confronted in a sort of senseless and surprising way by one of his co-workers. He doesn't really see this coming and it's the final straw and he decides that now is the time for him to quit his job and pursue his true dream of becoming an actor. Now Bryce lives in Leicester, North Carolina which is a fictional town but it's a s small town. There's not a lot of, there's not an acting school there. And no, there aren't many opportunities and so he, he quits, he makes quite a scene out of quitting and leaves and... and How does his wife react to all of this? Well she, she, he finds his wife in the grocery store, and uh, she is not thrilled. I'll put it that way. And uh, she had, she's the realist in the relationship, and the story comes to a close with him sort of recognizing that he's lost. You know that he has to grow up. That he has to make the next step in his You know, this, life. this story hit me pretty hard mm. as, as someone who's now kind of over the hump in terms of being employed yeah. most of my life. Um, but looking back to the situation that many young people face now of having to work at a job that's not right for them yep. in order to provide the economic base for a marriage and children mm -hmm. and all of this kind of closing in at once. And so well, is that what you? Is, yes, is that what I mean we're a work? narcissistic generation that feel entitled to not work, you know, and it's a real reckoning and um, epiphany for a lot of us when we get out of school and when we start a family that uh, that's not the way things work. And I don't know what it was like in different generations, but a lot of growing up happens now at this point in mid twenties, um, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit later, when we have to come to terms with the fact that. A lot of people work jobs, a lot of people have dreams that don't come true, and uh, we have to come to terms with it. And it's, um, 
it's, uh, it can be heartbreaking and also empowering in a way once you come to terms with that. It is, it, in telling us a story like this mm -hmm. that does resonate because it, it in a, maybe in an exaggerated way or a different way, it, it puts us in, a posi in positions that many of us are in or that our children or grandchildren or friends are in. And, and uh, what are you trying to do to us or for us with a story like this? I'm trying to keep you entertained. Ah. In a way. <laughs> trying to keep you reading. And, um, you know, I'm trying to create dialect and uh, small explosions on the page. Well, so, so, so that I'm putting words in your mouth, but I'm real curious about this. So yeah. that part of it is that you give us a situation in which we can identify mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. And then you puff it up to make it bigger <laughs> than that to, and exaggerate it so that it, inter so that it gets our attention and entertains us. That's right. And I, then what do we walk away from? What do we take away from that? Well, I hope um, some sort of epiphany, some sort of, uh, I want the reader to see a moment of truth on the page that um, you might not have known was a truth, but that you can identify and say, yeah, actually, uh, that, that feels true to me. And I hope that it sometimes a surprise, but also feels familiar. And I mean, that sort of epiphany comes from putting characters in complicated, uncomfortable situations and seeing how they react, because sometimes as readers, we can identify and see ourselves in those characters. And, uh, you know, as strange as the situation might be, if it's in the middle of a hot dog factory in the middle of the night during a hurricane, you know, I think I want to create characters that we can identify with and see some of ourselves in. A lot of us can identify with one of the stories that you have in which there's a flooded basement that's uh, sure. coming about, uh, e whether it's in a hurricane or not, we all, or many of us, have this experience. And, and the st uh, story that I'm thinking about, I identify with because of the age uh, of the uh, main character, mm -hmm. who is a, an older guy uh, who's got a, uh, a, a, a daughter who's a little bit of a problem and a and as a result has a grandson that he's responsible for. That's right. And then you bring gypsies into the story. <laughs> and so, but what, what caught me is that you've got this guy, I can't remember his name. His name's Cotton. Cotton. Should remember that name. Um, I love that name. Cotton is the name of my son-in-law. And so, I, 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 so here I am That's as Cotton name. sitting on the stairs and because I've injured, because I've fallen down as a result of the slippery stairs and I can't move. That's right. I and you put me in this, the basement. <laughs> yeah. And so you put me in a, in a in the helpless situation that I think every person my age and older worries about most, mm. and that is, what is it going to be like when we can't take care of ourselves? And right. then, what, and then what do you, how do you make a story out of this with a gypsy? <laughs> well, a few different ways. You know, I mean, I send Cotton down to the basement, which is flooded, and as you mentioned, he trips and falls and breaks his hip. And so he's stranded down there, and while he's down there, these gypsies come in and start robbing the house and I always grew up with people in Greensboro referencing the gypsies as you know this sort of mythical group of burglars that would come through the neighborhood and it just always seemed I always thought they are not there are no gypsies here and people still swear that they're these you know roaming bands of gypsies and so it had lingered in my memory as this sort of unbelievable um, group that might enter at any moment. And so the, the, that connection of, of, of Cotton being stranded and this mythical group of bandits entering the house, you know, sort of uh, created a strange energy for me that I found really compelling. And um, it also enabled Cotton to face what you mentioned, this decline in his age and in turn his declining ability to care for his grandson. And so, you know, if I put those elements in play, uh, I, some interesting stuff came out. Well, it really did happen, and uh, there, there are two things I'd love for you to talk about. Yeah. One is the, um, the interconnective uh, meeting of Cotton and the Gypsy. Yeah. And, and how did you, what, 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 tell us what happened then and what well, you were after there. I, the, he interacts with this Gypsy who ends up actually lifting him out of the water a little bit. And, um, Robs his house, but he's not the um, he's not the evil character that 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 Cotton necessarily believed him to be. And on the other hand, at the end of the story, let me interrupt you because sure. uh, one one of the challenging things that you set up for yourself was that the gypsy couldn't speak English, <laughs> right. and so uh, mm -hmm. authors handle this challenge differently. Uh, some by putting in the language 
Uh, how, how did you? How did in, how you? How did you meet this challenge? Well, in my dialogue, when the gypsy speaks, it just says French in brackets because, to Cotton, all he's hearing is this person speaking French to him. It makes no sense. So, that was fun for me. It was sort of a you know a joke on the page, but also rings a little true. So you know, it's, it's exciting for me to use that as a little. But the gypsy device. gets the message from Cotton that he needs to be, he needs to be pulled out of the water, and the, water. the gypsy does that. That's right. All right, now I interrupted you. There's a second part of this well, that's really interesting. Cotton is, I think, surprised that the gypsy's not pure evil. At the same time, Cotton, in his time raising his grandson, has become closed in and did not interacting with his neighbors or the community as much as he once was, and is really blindsided to see that the, his neighbors and his, the parents of his son's friends really come to the aid of, of Lee, his grandson, and to Cotton in ways that he had not expected. Well, the grandson, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Cotton is, is rearing because the, his daughter, Cotton's mm -hmm. daughter, is just not able to do that. Right. But uh, the, the relationship between Cotton and his grandson is, as with all older adults and young children, is complicated. Yeah. But uh, Lee plays an important part in, this, in the resolution of this story. What happens? Well, Lee has gotten very interested in karate and ends up attacking the gypsy when he finds him. And uh, the gypsy flees the house. And so uh, Lee becomes the hero in a way. But Cotton doesn't want Lee to think he's the hero because that's not the lesson he doesn't want. He what doesn't is want. the lesson Cotton wants the, his grandson to the, the the he lesson that everybody else <laughs> took and that I took is what a hero. He beats up the, gyp the bad gypsy. Yeah, but Cotton wants Lee to do the smart thing and the safe thing, which would have been to go down the street to the neighbors and call 911, which is what he told them to do. But, um, you know, Lee was the hero, so he was excited. But is that the message of this little story, call 911? No, no. I mean, the message of this story is that families are complicated and that you figure out how to make it work, however, you can if that means a grandfather raising a grandson and using the neighbors to help then so be it but um, families aren't neat little bows they're complicated messy affairs and uh, you know love transcends that and family transcends that and that's some of what I was trying to address in this. Well you've got a bunch of other interesting little bit complex stories that are all set in this uh, little town of, Ly is it Lystra? Lystra, North Carolina, right. mythical town during uh, Hurricane Hugo. I wish we had time to talk about more of them, but I'm, um, I'm conscious uh, that uh, your success as a writer is, um, is growing and that you have a new book that you're gonna That's share right. with us. Yeah. Right. And this is a book called Doubles. Yes. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's brand new. I wish we had time to talk a lot about it, but tell us what you will about Doubles and uh, why it's even better than <laughs> Blood Markers. <laughs> well, Doubles, to begin with, is a, it's a more traditional novel. It's not, um, they aren't linked short stories, but it uh, follows a pair of Doubles tennis players who've been playing together since they were children, and they've become some of the best in the world, and when we meet them, they've stopped playing together, and uh, they're sort of coming to terms with a new point in their lives, and um, they figure out that they really need each other despite how complicated their relationship has become. So for me, it's sort of, uh, it's a wonderful fictional is device. Is it a book about tennis? Quite a bit about tennis. Is, but is, is the book about tennis? No. The book uses tennis to tell a story about complicated humans, my favorite thing. Someone told me that although you're, well, I, I shouldn't say this. Are, mm -hmm. are you, a t well, I should ask, are you, a, are you a tennis player? And is that how you? Well, I am. And are you a championship tennis player? Heck no, no, I am not. How did you get interested in the world of championship tennis? One of my best friends, um, his name's Trip Phillips, and he's a doubles tennis specialist. And he is now the assistant coach here at Chapel Hill, but he's been a close friend of mine since I was a teenager. And I had the opportunity to follow him around to a bunch of tournaments, and I got hooked. Why is the world of tennis, which is a mystery to many of us, yeah. uh, uh, something in which it is uh, possible to set the yeah. kind of story that you wanted to tell? Well, a few different reasons. One, because I was obsessed with it. And so I figured if I'm obsessed with it, that's something I should write about. It'll make it fun for me. 
secondly, doubles tennis is fascinating. Two men or women, or a man and a woman, if it's a mixed team, who have to work together. It's a partnership. It's a marriage of sorts. And so, like any marriage, if it's, you know. There are ups and downs to the relationship. There are ups and downs, and you have to work together. And sometimes you split, and then you wish that you hadn't split. And the, I mean, is that kind yes. of, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's another way to, it's, it's sort of a marriage that you're describing in, the, in yes. your book. Yes, and uh, as with any marriage, things become complicated, and these men who are on a doubles team have spouses and friends, and they weave a very complicated web. But uh, I like that idea that they have to work together to win. You well, know? we're going to want to read flood markers and doubles. Now, Thank um, you. What's, what's next? I, I have a new book in the works, but very early in the stages. So for now, I'm, I, I'm not going to talk about it yet. If we had time, I would press you. <laughs> <laughs> but we're out of time. We had a great time talking to Nick Brown about his first a critically acclaimed and successful book, Flood Markers, and also about his new book, Doubles. I wish we had time to talk to him more, but we'll look for Nick Brown, even though he's leaving North Carolina, at least temporarily, for a position in Colorado. Uh, but for us, you'll always be North Carolina. Thank you, DJ. Uh, thanks to Nick Brown for talking about Flood Markers, and thanks to all y'all for listening. I'll be right back here, same time next week, to introduce you to another North Carolina writer, and I hope you'll join me then. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV, and by the Mary Duke Biddle Foundation, Quail Ridge Books and Music, and the North Carolina Humanities Council. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.